Welcome to the Straight Way of Grace Ministries informational series, Revealing Islam. Some Muslims assert that Islam is the first religion to raise the status of women equal to that of men. In this presentation, we will examine what Islam actually teaches and some of the tragic results of Islam upon women in Islamic countries. We now pull back the veil and reveal the true status of women in Islam. In the Muslim faith, the Islam religion grown in America because of one thing. People don't know what Islam is and there's a lot of deception, a lot of lie. I hope that tonight you will notice how much deception, how much lie. We're talking about women in Islam. This is the second largest group in America who believe in this religion after black. And amazing, so many of the black who follow the nation of Islam, they follow a cult. They're not even Muslim. But they don't know. They think they have the true faith. And in, in the uh, public, uh, the black community, communities and black Muslim communities in America, they're really building their faith on hate, hate to the white and hate to the Christian faith, and hate and hate. And that's what we found in Islam. That's what his religion is all about. Uh, tonight we'll be talking about women in Islam. It was uh, five years ago, perhaps six years ago, I was uh, just uh, in New Orleans uh, doing my study in the undergrad, and a friend of mine invited me to go to uh, the university, New Orleans University. And there, there was a, a woman uh, teaching about women in Islam. And I thought, wow, what can she teach about women in Islam? What is she, does she have as a material to encourage some woman to become Muslim? I, I wonder what she's teaching. And I went there, I'm so excited, and I, I, I'll be honest with you, I opened my Quran and I got some passages ready and I marked my Quran for a different part, which is really what you're going to hear tonight. And as, as she started talking, she talked for a good 45 minutes, and she, saw, she said so much wonderful things about women in Islam, and you're going to hear some of them tonight, and it's like, what in the world this woman is talking about? She could not even quote one verse from the Quran or one hadith to support what she's teaching, and she is a doctor. And then after she finished, she said, question and answer. I said, praise God, now I can ask a question because I really want to ask a question. And then the, there was a young lady in the front. Uh, the group was larger than us here tonight. And then one lady in the front raised up her hand. And, and she said, uh, Dr. Sahar, how can I become a Muslim? And she said, Dr. Sahar, answer. She said, I'm not here to tell you to be a Muslim. That's not my whole purpose of speaking to you tonight about Islam. I just want to tell you the truth. She said to her, you and others who would like to become Muslim, after the meeting is over, we can gather together, and then I can tell you how to become a Muslim. I was standing all the way in the back, and I uh, stand up and I <laughs> clap my hand for 10 seconds, and I said, excellent speech, Dr. Sahar. She said, thank you. They have two wonderful cameras, zoom on me. And I said to her, I, uh, I'm not surprised this wonderful lady in the front, she would like to become Muslim. If I am a woman, I would love to become Muslim myself according to what I heard from you. But where in the world do you come up with this information? She said, that's all over the Quran, that's all over the Hadith. She said, I said, well, why didn't you quote for us some of these verses, some of these uh, Hadiths, so we can learn more in depth? She said, well, because uh, we, they only give me an hour and there's not enough time to quote verses from the Quran. And I said to her, would you mind if I share some of the verses of the Quran? And I start reading three, four verses. It was the opposite of what she taught this hour. The camera turned off and everybody was upset. They did not allow me to speak the following day. And I told her, please, Dr. Sahar, I beg you, before you continue going one university after one university, cheating and deceiving hundreds of the young ladies in this country to make them believe in Islam, would you read the Quran once? Would you learn what the Hadith teach about what you're talking about? And if you found anything in the Quran or the Hadith to support what you're teaching, please do so. May all America become Muslim. But if not, don't deceive the American people. Listen to some of the lies they tell to the American people. At the beginning, Islam was the most revolutionary liberalization of women's rights the civilized world has ever seen. Is this true? A little known fact is that Islam brought by the Prophet Muhammad is the first religion to raise women's status to be equal with men. Really? How about this one? 
Today, people think that women are liberated in the West and that the women's liberation movement began in the 20th century. Actually, the women's liberation movement was not begun by women, but was revealed by God to a man in the 7th century by the name of Muhammad, who is known as the last prophet of Islam. The Quran and the traditions of the prophet are the sources from which every Muslim woman derives her rights and duties. The Quran is the source where women can get the right. This is the source for the information. The Hadith is the source. I'm going to share with you tonight what the Quran teaches about women and what the Hadith teaches about women. Notice this next slide is very important as well. God knows best that which He created. He created human beings. He is a God of wisdom and a God of all knowledge, and so therefore He knows what is best. And He decrees that which is best for humanity, His creatures. Therefore, Muslims try to live by a code of law which is an expression of that belief. Now, I don't want to discuss the various details of the code of law because that, I feel, would not really benefit us in this lecture. What was his lecture was about? Elevation of women's status. He's not going to talk about the code of law which God Almighty, Allah of Muhammad, have given in the law, in the Quran, in the Hadith, because it is not going to support his lies. You didn't get it, do you? God knows humanity. God knows men. God knows women. He is the one who created us. Therefore, God put into the book of the Quran, and he says through Muhammad, through the hadiths, all the code, all the rules, how, that's how you treat women, that's how you live with women, that's how many women you marry, that's how you divorce, and that's how you treat, and all this is the code of law. And because God knows better, he gives the best law, the best rules. And the gentleman here is talking about this, uh, as the elevation of woman's status, he's not going to talk about this law because it is not going to support his teachings. Because, in other words, I am lying at you. And I'm not going to quote to you a verse from the Quran because it is not going to support what I'm trying to deceive you. Listen to this story. I loved Asham. We met at college and dated steadily through my junior and senior years. With Asham, I felt like a princess. He showered me with gifts and treated me with a gracious chivalry that I hadn't known in any American man. He was thoughtful, considerate, ruggedly handsome, intelligent, and oddly spiritual. I did not give much thought to his devout Muslim faith. As a casual Baptist, I assumed that everyone who attended church, a synagogue, or a mosque was basically on the same track. His morality certainly seemed higher than that of the other white boys I had dated. We married in the summer and vacationed in his home country in a beautiful, majestic place with tall spires and rolling hills. At the mosque, I was bemused by the practices. Back in the United States, we settled into a routine of work play, and eventually children. The changes in Asham appeared slowly. Occasionally, he became abrupt with me and our five-year-old son. He constantly sent money overseas, supposedly to his family, and was secretive, especially when his friends came around. Every Friday, Asham took our son to the mosque, although I no longer went with them. Then one Friday, I discovered that Asham had left the country with our son. In the subsequent weeks, I discovered to my horror that myself and my child were considered Muslims, converted at least on paper. Thus, my son had to be raised in Islam. Because my rights to my child were minimal in his country, my child was gone and my life was forever marred. I did not know that I had joined a growing culture, a culture of white American women who marry foreign Muslim men. This is not just one story. The last six years I traveled in uh, 13 states in the United States, and believe it or not, almost every church I meet somebody who had married a Muslim man, or her daughter, or granddaughter, or nephew, or somebody, uh, uh, niece, or somebody from some church is married to a Muslim man. Some of these Muslim men are so wonderful, nice people. 
and some of them are not what they seem to be in the beginning. When I say wonderful, I didn't mean they are a godly Christian one. They treat their wife with respect. But there are so many others who are here to marry your daughter and granddaughter just to get the green card, just to be a citizen. Some of them already have a wife overseas. I know some of them personally. But somebody is lying. The first people tell us wonderful statements about Islam and how women in Islam is uh, elevated. She is equal to men, and, 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 and women in Islam have the right to do this and this and this and that. And by the way, the story we're going to hear tonight, the long lie from uh, Dr. Rukia Abdul Maksud, you're going to hear all her talk in her article, and it's still online. You can go online and read it for yourself. And I'm going to respond to all her lies because, because of these lies, many women in this country becoming Muslim every day. Listen to what the second man in command after Hitler says. If you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. The truth is the mortal enemy of the lie. The important is the lie to be big enough and you repeat it often enough, loud enough, people will believe it. It's been five years or six years since September 11. And all what you hear on the media is Islam loving peaceful religion. What did we found Sunday evening? The Quran is not anything except hate. There is no love in the Quran. You could not find in the Quran a verse teach to love somebody. Literally, there is not one verse in the Quran teach to love. Somebody. God never loves sinners. Not like what they lie and tell you in the media. Lie big enough. You repeat it often enough. People believe it. Many people have serious questions about the religion of Islam. Who are Muslims and what do they believe? Liberal Muslim scholars and clerics spin the news and continually promote Islam as the religion of peace and that Jews, Christians and Muslims worship the same God. But is this true? Where can we turn for the answers? To truly know what a faith teaches, you have to go to the book. And for the last 1400 years, that book for Muslims is the Quran. This collection of the sayings and teachings that Muhammad claimed to have received from Allah is the sacred text for over a billion Muslims worldwide. But the Quran was written in Arabic, so how can we in the West learn what it really says? Muslim apologists have produced several English translations over the years, but these have been carefully edited to hide many of the blatant errors, immoral teachings, and violent commands throughout the book. In the beginning of our ministry, we decided to tell the truth about Islam. Uh, therefore, we decided to buy the English translation of the Quran to use the verses which is written there. Sadly, I could not find one Quran to present the truth as it is written in the Arabic language. They sugarcoat it. They water it down. That's why we decided to go ahead and translate the Quran from Arabic to English, a true English translation. The Straight Way of Grace Ministry, in cooperation with Arab and English scholars from around the world, has produced the most accurate English translation of Islam's holy book ever printed. Read for yourself exactly what Muhammad taught his followers about war and violence, about sex and marriage, about the treatment of infidels, and more importantly, what he said about Jesus. Islam is not what I share with you or what some moderate Muslim tell you. Islam is the verses of the Quran. We must separate Muslim from Islam. There are so many wonderful Muslim people out there, but they are not true Muslim because simply they don't practice what the Quran teaches. So many American people say they accept Islam. They do not have any problem for Muslim to practice Islam in America, but same people rejecting Sharia, Islamic law. Not knowing that Sharia, Islamic law, is a practice of the verse of the Quran. This translation has been produced with the modern student in mind, with several key features including study notes for the reader, detailed notes concerning errors and contradictions in the text, careful comparisons between the Quran and biblical accounts, and references to the original sources that Muhammad borrowed from. Special sections discuss key topics such as a compilation of non-Arabic words and idioms found in the Quran, an easy-to-follow chart outlining the fulfilled prophecies concerning Jesus in the Old Testament, and a challenging gospel invitation to introduce the reader to the scientific, historical, and biblical reasons for accepting the true Jesus as the only Lord and Savior. In the book of Hosea, chapter 4, verse 6, the Bible said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. It is time for us to read the Quran. It's time for us to find the truth for ourselves. For ordering and more information, please visit thestraightway.org. 
Read the Quran for yourself and understand the roots of this dangerous faith. Individual copy and case pricing are available. This is Ruqiyya Maksud, and I would like you to hear her lies, and I will respond to her article statement by statement. English convert to Islam, Rakia Waris Maksud, is the author of over 30 books on Islam and other subjects. A former head of religious studies at various UK inner city secondary schools, she is probably Britain's leading authority on GCSE Islamic studies. A British woman, she became a Muslim a few years ago and in her short age of believing in Islam and becoming a Muslim, she wrote 30 book. She is a great teacher in England, and I believe because of this woman, there are hundreds, perhaps thousands of young ladies in England become Muslim. I know of a friend of mine here in America, Miss Virginia, I believe 82, 83. She was working so hard to please her husband to the point she converted so many American women to Islam to please her husband, and she herself was not even a believer in Islam. Sister Rukia identifies with the battle to preserve Islam as the one true faith, tolerant, noble, and compassionate, in face of the growth of the other Islam, which is extremist and intolerant, and which she regards as both false and dangerous. See, Rukia here, uh, Ms. Rukia, she's talking about a different two kind of Islam. There is a nice Islam and there is a bad Islam. There is a good Islam and there is a, uh, a terrible Islam. And she working hard to preserve the good Islam. Or in other words, she making up a new Islam. What I called a Sunday baloney Islam. Her own opinion, her own thought, how she like Islam to be. And this is the Islam she is preserving. She said... How can anyone justify Islam's treatment of women when it imprisons the Afghans under blue shuttlecock burqas and makes Pakistani girls marry strangers against their will? Two things here she rejected about the Islam, the bad Islam, which she does not believe to be the true Islam. The coverage for the Muslim, how women dress in the hijab, we'll talk about a little bit later, and then the marriage for the children against their will. It's terrible thing she does not like about Islam, and she would like to change. She would like to make it a different Islam. Which in it will be a woman be free like those Muslims in England, and they can choose their husband. I have a question for Dr. Rukia. Did Prophet Muhammad marry women against their will? Why ask this question? Listen to this verse, very important verse in the Quran. And the Quran says, Indeed, there was in the Apostle of Allah a noble example for you, for him who was hoping in Allah and in the last day, and remember Allah much. See, Muhammad is the greatest example. He is the greatest prophet who ever walked on this earth. And through Muhammad, we can know what to do. And he is the one who is after God on earth. So if Muhammad did it, Muslims have the right to do it. If Muhammad said it, Muslims have the right to say it. If Muhammad believed in it, Muslims must believe it. He is the greatest example. Did Prophet Muhammad marry women against their will? Did Prophet Muhammad force women to be covered from head to toe? This is the two things she rejected in her first slide. Here is a list of books. I wish they are in English so you can read them. Maybe someday I will translate some of these books to you. But we know from this book that Muhammad married Khadija. Khadija was his first wife. She was uh, 15 years older than him. He married her when he was 25. She had four husbands before him, and he's number five. Some sources say that three husbands, and he's number four. And he was living with her, and she was his only wife as long as she lived. He was living with her money. She was the boss. She proposed to him, he accepts the proposition, and he married her, and they were happy for long 15 years. At the age of 40, Muhammad claimed to be a prophet. She supported him so much, she made him a prophet. But when she died, Muhammad started having different wives. He had a wife by the, by the name uh, Sauda bint Zim'ah. She was not a beautiful woman, she was not attractive. He just married her to take care of his beloved wife, Aisha. I ask for a six years old child. We don't have one, do we? Imagine with me. Six years old, Aisha, married to the prophet of God, Muhammad, 54 years old man. 
And when you read the hadith, it will make you cry. She was swinging on the swing on the tree outside the house. Her mama went and took her out from the tree, washed her face, and put her on the lap of the prophet of God on the bed. And Muslim scholars say, wait a minute, Brother Islam, you have to tell the whole truth. Muhammad did not have intercourse with her. He did not slept with her until she turned nine. I said, I'm sorry, so 57 to 9. What do he used to do during the three years? Very simple. He used to touch her by his leg, putting his leg between her leg. What do you call this in America? Can, man, can a man do this in America today? What, what is a punishment for a man, a 57 years old, to touch a little girl? But she was his wife. But the question is, did he marry her with her will or against her will? Yes, she was his wife. A six years old, a seven years old child know how to say, yes, I do. Muhammad married the little girl, six years old, his favorite wife, Aisha, against her will. And Muhammad is a great prophet, and Muhammad is a great example. So Muslims have the right to marry children. As a matter of fact, the Quran clearly teaches that a man can marry a woman just because she's a girl, and it found out she's a girl. No age for when man can marry. Quran and the Hadith. I will show you the verses later. How about his wife, Zainab bint Jahsh? Uh, Zainab bint Jahsh is a little bit different story. Remember the verse we read yesterday, and I told you I'm going to share with you tomorrow about when Muhammad said, I am mother of any man among you. Why Muhammad said that? Because the Muslim people or people Arab around his, uh, the Arab around his time, they said, shame on you, Muhammad, to marry your daughter-in-law. Who is daughter-in-law here? Zainab bint Jahsh. Prophet Muhammad went to visit with uh, his daughter and his son, Zaid, adoption son. He was not his real son, but he was uh, his son by adoption. And as he go by his house, and I read this in the old Muslim scholar books, he saw from her what caused him to lust after her. She was not dressed right. She ran to the door because the apostle of God is by the door. And she, she, somehow some of her body has been shown. And Muhammad said his famous statement, Subhana muqallib al How great is God who changed my heart towards you. I no longer love you as a daughter-in-law, but I love you as a man love a woman. She told this to her husband. Her husband ran to his daddy, uh, uh, father by adoption, and he said, I want to divorce my wife. No, 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 keep your wife, man. No, no. No, I want to divorce my wife. I don't have any desire for her anymore. I don't love her anymore. And when Zaid divorced, Zaid, that's his son's name, divorced her, God married her to Muhammad. Listen to the story in the Quran. And when you said to whom Allah had graced on, and you graced on, keep your wife to yourself and fear Allah, and you did hide in yourself what Allah would reveal, and you feared the people, and Allah is more worthy to be feared. So when Zaid had satisfied his desire from her, we married her to you, so that it would not be a shame on the believers to marry the wives of their sons. There was no shame on the Prophet where Allah had ordained for him. The custom of Allah with those who have gone before and the command of Allah was a predetermined decree. Zainab used to brag about her marriage to her husband by telling the all other wives of the prophet that you have married the prophet because some men intervene in your marriage or some lady, but I was married to the prophet of God by God Almighty himself. God marry me to Muhammad. Did really Zainab said yes when Muhammad asked her hand to be married to? Muhammad has forced women to be married to him against their will. Listen to Dr. Rukiya one more time. How can you respect a religion that forces women into polygamous marriages, mutilates their genitals, forbids them to drive cars, and subjects them to humiliation of instant divorce? A woman forbidden from driving a car in Riyadh will cheerfully take the wheel when abroad, confident that her country's bizarre law has nothing to do with Islam. In fact, None of these practices are Islamic at all. None of these practices is Islamic at all. What happened if I open the Quran and I show you this practice is the heart of Islam. It is the heart teaching of the Quran. 
You see, here Dr. Rukia, she's trying to tell you, all these things happen in Riyadh, in Saudi Arabia, the treatment of women and how they literally abuse their women. It is not Islam, it's just a bizarre country law. Afghan women educated before the Taliban rule know that banning girls from school is forbidden in Islam, which encourages all Muslims to seek knowledge from cradle to grave from every source possible. What is Taliban? Taliban is the practice of the Quran. Before Taliban take over Afghanistan, women used to go to school. But now, women do not go to school. This was written before the war in Afghanistan, obviously. Because now women can go back to school. You know why? Because America bring democracy, bring freedom to the Afghani women, not the Quran, not Islam. And then she said that Islam teaches that all children seek knowledge. I'm sorry, that's not what Muhammad said. That's not what the Quran teaches. Notice that all what she's going to say in this article be her own personal opinion, have nothing to do with the teachings of the Quran or the Hadith. Listen to what Muhammad said. Do not let women into all of the rooms and do not teach them how to write. Teach them to spin and recite Surah Al-Nur. Muhammad commanded the Muslim not to teach their daughters to read and write, but to memorize chapter 24 in the Quran. And we're going to quote to you two verses of this chapter in our seminar tonight. But did really Muhammad say, teach your children to read and write? The girls? No, only men. And then even men, Muhammad really never said to the men to go and read the, uh, and study uh, 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 just the normal knowledge we have in our school today. He commanded men to learn how to ride the horses or the camel, to use the sword, to swim, to use the spears. Why? Because these are the things they need to invade the world. And women do not move all over the house. They stick in one corner in one room. They didn't even have freedom to move in their own homes. The Quran is addressed to all Muslims, and for the most part, it does not differentiate between male and female. Man and woman, it says, were created of a single soul and are moral equals in the sight of God. Women have the right to divorce, to inherit property, to conduct business, and to have access to knowledge. How many lies we have in this passage here? Women have the right to divorce. I would love to see a Muslim woman in the Muslim world has divorced her husband the last 1,400 years. Just one case. I'm not talking for two or three. One woman who were able to divorce her husband in Egypt the last 1,400 years. It never happened. That is a lie. In the Quran teach man can divorce their wife, but wife cannot divorce her husband. I'll quote you the verse. Women can conduct business. Woman can own property. Woman can, I mean, what else woman cannot do? But think, think, think with me of the verse she quotes. Man and woman, that's the only verse she's going to quote, are created from one soul. Is this true? Listen to the verse of the Quran. O you people, fear your Lord who created you from a single soul and created a wife from it. And from them he spread many men and women. And fear Allah of whom you ask of him and the wombs. Surely Allah was watching over you. Did really God created Adam and Eve from one soul? Read the Bible carefully. One flesh, but not one soul. God used a rib from Adam, and from this rib he made Eve. And Eve, when you read the Quran, by the way, Eve does not exist. It's, she's not there. Her name was never written somewhere. But does Adam and Eve have one soul or two separate souls? That's the verse she quote from the Quran, and it is theology false verse. It's not true. Eve's soul have nothing to do with Adam's soul. O oh, you who have believed, retaliation is decreed on you for the murdered, the free man for the free, and the slave for the slave, and the female for the female. I'm sorry. The Quran never said man and woman are equal, even in the kisas or even in the retaliation on the revenge. You know how barbarian this verse is? Let me explain to you this verse in other words. If I killed a free man, if I'm a free man, I must be killed. If one of my slaves 
kill a free man. They don't kill my slaves. They kill me, the free man. If I kill your pastor's wife, they don't kill me. They kill my wife. If I killed one of his slaves, they don't kill me. They kill one of my slaves. The laws have to be equal to what has gone, what's coming to be. The revenge must be equal. A free man for a free man. A slave for a slave. And notice, women come in the third part after slave, a female for a female. Muhammad asked some women, Isn't the witness of a woman equal to half that of a man? The women said, Yes. He said, This is because of the deficiency of the woman's mind. Women, you are stupid. If we're going to go to court of law right now, I need two men. If I could not find two men, one man and two women, and I will quote you the verse of the Quran a little bit later. Muhammad said, If there is a bad omen in anything, it is in the house and the woman and the horse. You are bad luck. Listen to the punishment for women and men who commit the same sin. And for those who commit indecency among your women, so call four witnesses from among you against them. So, if they testify, so detain them within their houses until death takes them, or Allah makes another way for them. I wish I have time to talk about this verse a little bit later. But you imprison them. Okay? Two women commit a, uh, commit a, a, a lesbian lifestyle, sexual immorality. They be put in home until God have another way. And the other way is later was to be stoned to death. How about men? And if two among you commit it, then punish them both. So if they repent and reform, then leave them alone. Surely Allah was relenting, merciful. Why not imprison the men for life too? If you put a woman in prison for her sin, you should have equal punishment for men. But men punish them. Physically, by, by, uh, by talk, uh, bring shame on them, and then if they repent, let them go free. It is not equal. Punishment for the same sin. Men and women were never equal in the Quran. A wife is forbidden to perform extra prayers or observe fasting without the permission of her husband. You can't even pray. You cannot even fast or do some uh, study or reading of the Quran on your own. You must have permission from your husband. And if your husband said no, that's it. You pray on your own without permission of your husband. It was a waste of time. Wow, men and women are equal in the Quran, in the Hadith? I'm sorry, that was a lie. The Bible says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. You see the difference? Where is the freedom has been given to women? How woman was, equal, was able to be equal to men except in the true word of God, the Bible, as Paul writes to the Galatians. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make any difference if you are a man or a woman, free or slave, Jew or Greek. You are all one in Christ. Now, I'm not making it up. I'm reading the scripture, the Holy Bible, and what the New Testament teaches about the differences between men and women. There is no differences. We are equal in Christ. The Quran says, Men are in charge of women because Allah preferred some of them above the others and because of what they spend out of their money. So good women are obedient, guarding in secret that which Allah has guarded. Men is in charge. We are not equal. And wait until you hear the rest of this verse. Chapter 4, verse 34. I kept you the rest later. See the three dot here? It's coming up. Now, what did Peter say? Husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. You'd be surprised how Muslims read the Bible. You go to the Bible and they found out some passages where it seemed to be uh, no equal treatment between men and women. For when the Bible said that uh, women should be submission to, submitted to their husband, or women should be this, or women should be this. See here, look, the Bible does not make them equal. Men or men, you should read the rest of the story in the Bible. 
Yes, the women in the Bible were commanded by God, by the Holy Spirit through Paul and many others, to be submissive to, to their husband, to be obedient to their husband. But don't forget that the Bible also said that command us to submit to one another. And the Bible command men to love their wife, even as Christ loved the church. If you show me a husband who is willing to take the bullet or die for his wife, and show me a wife who are very respectful, obedient to her husband, I'll show you a strong marriage. The word divorce will never be mentioned in this house. It is not just for a wife to be submissive to the husband. It's also for the husband to love his wife even to death as Christ died for the church. You cannot have one without the other. Rokia lies some more and she said, Some of the commands are alien to Western tradition. Requirements of ritual purity may seem to restrict a woman's access to religious life, but are viewed as concessions. During ministration or postpartum bleeding, she may not pray the ritual salah or touch the Quran, and she does not have to fast, nor does she need to fast while pregnant or nursing. She put it on culture. I'm sorry, it is not culture. That's the teachings of the Quran. One of the reasons women will never make it to heaven, as you see in our seminar, most of them will die and go to hell because they have less prayer and they have less reading to the Quran. They have less fasting. And these are the things to do to get to heaven. And God in the Quran said, you can't do this because you are unpure, because you are unclean. I could not find this in the teaching of the New Testament. There's no such a thing is impure or unclean for women. O you who have believed, do not come near the prayer while you are drunk until you know what you are saying, nor after sexual orgasm, except that you are merely passing by until you wash. And if you were sick or traveling, or one of you has relieved himself, or you have touched the women, so you did not find water, then rub your face and your hands with good dirt. Surely Allah was pardoning, forgiving. The man at home got clean, washed himself, ready to go and pray. In his way to the mosque, physically he touched a woman. Ah, now he is unclean. So what he should do now? He needs to be rewashed again. What if there is no water? He gets some clean dirt. Good dirt, clean dirt is mixed. Explain to you what is clean dirt? Is the dirt does not have neither pee pee or poo poo of camel. Dirt. And he rubbed his hand and he rubbed his face. And now he is ready to pray. You know what the Quran teaches? Women are dirtier. Okay? But they are dirtier, dirty, I'm sorry, women are dirty and they are dirtier than dirt. It said, if a woman touch a man, will she become unclean too? No, only if a man touch a woman, he become unclean. And he wash himself by dirt. My mama told me there is no such a thing as clean dirt or good dirt. Don't play in dirt. Because dirt is dirty. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall be also this, that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial of her. What did this woman do? She touched Jesus. Even Simon the first is a sharp, smart man. He thought in his mind, he said, <laughs> this guy is Jesus, is not a good prophet. You see, if he know what kind of woman she's touching him, mm -mm, he will not allow her to touch him. Jesus not only knew what kind of woman she is, he can read Simon's mind. Turned out to Simon. Simon, I know what kind of woman this is. This woman has touched Jesus. She washed his feet with her tears. She dries him by her hair. She kissed him by, his, by her lips. And she anointed him with the perfume. And she left the place. Not making Jesus unclean, but she left pure. Not because Jesus said to her, your sin is forgiven, which he said, because Jesus paid for her sin when he went to the cross a few weeks or months later. And by the way, the prophecy of Jesus has been fulfilled. I heard this message about this woman in Indonesia, in Egypt, in Europe, here in America, some people from North America, uh, South America and from everywhere. The woman touched Jesus and she left clean. 
And it came to pass that afterward he went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and certain women which had been revealed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Shusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. And dwell still in your houses, and do not go out in public, dressed as in the days of your former ignorance, but perform prayer, and bring the zakat, and obey God and the apostle. Surely God only desires to put away uncleanness from you, people of the house. Now we look at two different things here. Dr. Luke is not just adding few names to make few sentences in his book, but he mentioned all these women's names because they have a great role in the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. They traveled with Jesus, they called for Jesus and his disciples, they cleaned their clothes, they were helping with other women, they were helping with children, they were doing a great ministry with Jesus. But in the case of Islam, according to the Quran, chapter 33 and verse 33, Muhammad is commanding them to stay at their homes. You tell me? Islam have a high respect for women in ministries, you could not find it except in the Christian faith. Notice only, when you read the Bible, women was at the tomb, women was at the cross, and then at the tomb. Women were in the upper room, women was in the early church, women was always there in the church. Women were involved in ministry. In Islam, women do not go anywhere except stay home. Even when they go to the mosque, they have separate place back in the back, and I tell you why. You could not have women sit with men like we're sitting here today. They have to be in the back. Here we go. Abdallah ibn al-Samit said, Abu Dar said, the messenger of Allah said, when one of you stands in prayer, what definitely constitutes a barrier for him is an object placed in front of him of the same height as the back of a camel saddle. If it is not in front of him and of the same height as the back of a camel saddle, then some stray donkey, or some woman passing, or some black dog will cut off his prayer. I said, O oh, Abu Dar, what is it that makes a black dog different from a red or yellow dog? He replied, O oh, dear cousin, I asked the Messenger of Allah that exact same question. He said that the black dog is a devil. You see, if a woman walks in the front while men are praying, or a man look at a woman, or if it's a black dog, demon-possessed dog, or a donkey, the prayer is cut off. The angels were supposed to be sitting on your right hand to write down that here he is, Brother Muhammad, Brother Ali, one more prayer. The angel will leave the mosque, will leave the room where, be, where people are praying. Women are equal to a donkey and a black dog, a demon possessed, and three of them will cut the prayer. Therefore, women cannot go to the mosque and sit next to men or stand next to men and pray. See, they lie at them in America, and they told them, you're equal to me, you can even lay the prayer. Oh, they become Muslim. They run to the mosque, back off, women, sit in the back. They get upset. You know what? They could not find one mosque to allow them to pray to get men and women. They went to a Presbyterian church, and the Presbyterian church gave them a small fellowship hall, and there women were able to pray with men. Wow. Inside the church, but not inside the mosque. What Islam they are learning, I don't know. He is the true Islam. He is Muhammad's own words. I did not make it up. That's come from their own books. Women in Islam equal to a donkey and a black dog, and three of them cut the prayer of men. The veiling of Muslim women is a more complex issue. Very complex. Certainly the Quran requires them to behave and dress modestly. Mm -hmm. But these strictures apply equally to men. Absolutely. Only one verse refers to the veiling of women, stating that the prophet's wife should be behind a hijab when his male guests converse with them. You know, this woman, she have no clue what she's talking about. Only one verse. What if I quote you right now four verses in the Quran? Only one verse. And one verse said, the prophet's wife, not her, but the prophet's wife. What if I show you that all Muslim, all believing Muslim women must be covered? And where is me? Have you ever seen a man walk like this in the street? Covered with hijab? Only the jihadists cover their face because they don't want you to know who they are, so that you don't arrest them or stop them. But otherwise, men do not cover in Egypt or anywhere in the Muslim world. 
Listen to the verse. And say to the believing women to restrain their eyes and to guard their private parts and do not display their ornaments except that which appears from it and that they throw their veils over their bosoms and do not display their ornaments. Literally, when you look at a woman, if you see any part of her body appear, it, she has to be... Actually, the only explanation to this, I, I'm going to quote you another one from my head. I don't have the verse up there. When woman walk in the street and you can know if she's a woman or a man, she is not dressed right. She has to be square. Her bosom, her breast should not shown up under the clothes. So she has to be square. And the eyes, the hadith, I just found this a little bit later here. We're working on the translation that she only allowed to see by one hole in front of her left eye. Neither of these two women we saw in the picture a little bit ago are right. The one, they have all her eyes, both eyes, I can see them. The other one dressed nicely. The true hijab is woman to be completely covered, only have one hole in front of her left eye so she can see through, so she does not fall off as she's walking. Dr. Rokia, in the beginning of our seminar, she said, how, can, how dare people do that? That's not Islam at all. That's a culture. I'm sorry, Dr. Rokia. That's the Quran. And if you don't believe the Quran is Islam, I don't know what Islam you believe in. What about polygamy, which the Quran endorses up to the limit of four wives per man? The Prophet, of course, lived at a time when continual warfare produced large numbers of widows. In these circumstances, polygamy was encouraged as an act of charity. Needless to say, the widows were not necessarily sexy young women, but usually mothers of up to six children who came as part of the deal. W were you there, ma'am? Notice now, notice. When she talk about large wife, number of wives, she will tell you there were continual warfare produced large number of widows. But if she's talking about how Islam is spread in the world, she will tell you there was never any warfare, there were never any widows. Same woman. Why for why? Because there was a lot of widows. And it was not for the fun of having an uh, intimate relationship with their women, with this woman. It's just an act of charity. So we in our church should have an act of charity. All widows will come to come, and we're going to marry them to men in the church who already have one or two wives, and it's an act of charity. Can you do charity without sleeping with women? Do you have to be married to them to do charity work? And then she said, they're all old women. Wow. And they all have six or maybe ten children. And they all come one package, you know. You're going to have the woman, you're going to have her children. You're going to feed all these kids. Real hard work, charity work. Let me think with me. Think with me for a minute. How old was Muhammad when he married Aisha? He was 57 years old and she was nine. And he is a great example. So all the Muslim men in his days who go and fight were 100 years old. No, they were 20 and 30 years old. 20 and 30 years old young men will have wife 45, 50 years old. No, they will be 15 or 10. As a great example, the prophet is, everybody's going to find. So here is 20 years old, 30 years old man, married to a 10, 15 years old child, and they go in war and get killed. What they left behind? Old women with six or eight children. Wow, common sense. Polygamy is no longer common for various good reasons. The Quran states that wives need to be treated fairly and equally, a difficult requirement even for a rich man. Moreover, if a husband wishes to take a second wife, he should not do so if the marriage will be to the detriment of the first. So I go to my wife, I say, Vicky, honey, would you mind? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have another wife. Oh, no, you can't. Okay, honey, I'm sorry. It was just a thought. And then the fairness or equally, that's a hard thing for even rich men, she said. You know what it is, the explanation of equal treatment according to the Muslim scholar? If you buy one of them a dress, you have to buy everyone else a dress. I can make it very, very, very nice, very equal. Buy nothing to nobody. <laughs> they all be equal. Did Muhammad treat his wife equally? 
He is a great example. Did he treat Aisha, his favorite wife, as every other of the 12 other wives? No, he did not. Aisha was his favorite. He spent twice his time with her, and so on and on and on with every other thing. He favored Aisha. He used to receive the revelation of God while he is in her dress. He prayed with her while she is not clean. He treated her special. She is his favorite wife. Don't you dare tell me that Treating equally means equally. If Muhammad didn't do it, why Muslim have to do it? And he is a great example. Listen to this verse. And if you fear that you cannot deal fairly among the orphans, so marry what appeals to you from the women, two and three and four. So if you fear that you will not treat them equally, so one wife, or have sex with what your right hand possesses. This is near that you may not have hardship. I have a very difficult time to understand what the orphan have to do with the marriage. If you, if you feel, if you fear that you cannot deal fairly among the orphan, what did men supposed to do with the orphan? Sleep with them? I'm, I'm trying to understand this part. Nobody have given me an answer yet. But then he said, marry two and three and four. If you cannot fear the, treat them equally, equally fairly equally then one and we don't stop there i'm sorry there's more to come and all what your right hand possessed or what your right hand what is the right hand possessed all the concubine and all the slave you can buy does islam teach slavery yes i wish i have time to talk about that even today still Christian women and some other women around the world are bought by the rich Saudi and Kuwaiti and Bahraini and all those people who have money. I saw them by my own eye in the Kuwait airport. Three years ago, I went to the airport. We were supposed to go to Iraq. And inside the airport, 2.30 in the morning, a long line of women, children, from 5, 6 years old to 25 years old. And all of them were black, some coming from some African country, perhaps uh, uh, Sudan, perhaps uh, Somalia. I don't know where they come from. And three men with a stick hit them in the shoulder. Back up, woman. Straight, stand straight, stand straight. Hit them in the shoulder. And I knew this was a line of slave. And because I have three other missionaries with me, when we have 70,000 Bible with us, and I was, I mean, we, we're, we, we're on a mission trip. I could not open my mouth. And my heart was aching me this night. I couldn't even sleep this night because I know. I wish I can talk to these ladies. I wish I can ask him. But what if they cannot speak Arabic? What if they cannot speak English? I really want to know where are they from? Who bought them? Who, who, who sells them to who? I want to investigate it. And I wish I was a CIA or some important body who can stop and ask and talk. But there were a line of slaves. Perhaps some of your sisters in Christ from Sudan sold to some Kuwaiti rich people. There is unlimited number of wives. Most Muslims in America, they will read you this verse up to this point. So if you fear that you will not treat them equally, so one. And they stop here. No, keep going. Tell them, keep going. Don't stop. Read the rest of the verse and the rest of the verse. And all what your right hand possessed. Unlimited number of wives. Slave and concubine. Concubine is the man, it is the child or the wife of the man you kill. And for those of your women who despair of menstruation, if you doubt that they may be pregnant, their prescribed waiting time is three months, as well as for those who have not yet begun menstruation. I studied this in college, marriage and divorce in Islam. Here is the rules in divorce. A man is married to a woman, and she is 45, maybe 50 years old, and she cannot have a baby. Obviously, she is old. She cannot have children. Well, a man is thinking, mm -mm, maybe she is pregnant. The best thing you do is, Hold her for three months. Watch her. She is not pregnant. Her belly did not get big. Then you can divorce her. Also, the one, she never have the bleeding time. How old is the children before they have the bleeding time? Any age. So if a man is married to a child, to a baby, two, three, four, five, six years old, you can also keep them for three months in case they are pregnant. Think with me. How holy is the Quran, the word of Muhammad?
For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. You love your wife as yourself. A man leave his father and mother, unite with his wife, and he become one flesh. Not two flesh, not three, not four, not all what your right hand possessed. As the man loved himself. Do you love to have second wife? Okay, allow your wife to have a second husband. We'll be living in chaos. It will be like an animal zoo. Sexual intimacy outside marriage is forbidden in Islam, including sex before marriage, adultery, or homosexual relationships. However, within marriage, sexual intimacy should be raised from the animal level to sadaka, a form of worship, so that each considers the happiness and satisfaction of the other rather than mere self-gratification. Notice when she speaks, she say each, everyone, both. That's not the reality in the Muslim world. That's not. That's not the reality in the Quran. She just adds this simple word and makes the equality between men and women as she go. So she's telling us here that no sex outside marriage. Really? Is that what the Quran teaches? Listen to this verse. And married women are also forbidden, except all that your right hand possesses. This is the decree of Allah for you, and it is lawful to you, besides this, to seek out women with your money, chaste without fornication. So whatever you enjoy by it from them, so give them their wages. It is an ordinance. And there will be no sin on you about what you have mutually agreed on after the ordinance. Surely Allah was knowing wise. This is the marriage for fun. First of all, if you look at the top, any married woman you cannot sleep with, but what your right hand possessed. If they are married, you can sleep with. Islam teaches it's okay for a man to sleep with his slave, even if she is married to another man. Wow. Then the marriage for fun. A few years ago, I was traveling, one of, a couple years ago or so, I was in Memphis Airport taking change flight, one of my speaking engagements. And I, I, I sit in this uh, in the pew, and it's two, three hours waiting for the next flight. And this lady is sitting next to me, and she has a book. It's a book written in Arabic, and I'm trying to read, and I cannot understand what she's reading. Quickly, I figure out it is Irani, Pharisee. If you speak, if you know, if you know English and French look alike, okay? But if you don't, read, if you don't know French, you cannot read the French, if, even if it have ABC in it. So I, I, I was trying to read her book, I could not figure out, and I found out she is from Iran. As I talked with her, I said, well, tell me, are you a Shiite? She said, yes, I am a Shiite. I said, well, you know what, dear sister, I have a question. It's really bothered me for a long time, and I never know any Shiite woman. Would you mind if I ask you this question? I really, and I set the stage as polite as I can, as nice as I can. I'm sorry, and maybe it's going to offend you, maybe it's going to hurt your feelings. If you don't feel like answering this question, you don't have to answer the question, but I really, really want to know the answer. What do you think of marriage for fun? I mean, she said, oh, it is a holy marriage. It's absolutely like, like any other marriage. I mean, I mean do you really don't mind if, <clears throat> if, if your husband have a sex relationship with another woman for 10 minutes or for half hour or for two days and it's marriage? She said, yes, it is a marriage. There's nothing wrong with it. I said, well, w w would, you, would you please explain to me what is the difference between this marriage and prostitution? Oh, no, 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 time out. There's big differences. Like what? She said, in marriage for fun, you cannot force a woman to sleep with you because you have to have, you know, her, her acceptance. She said, she must say, I do. I said, my dear sister, in America, you cannot force a prostitute to sleep with you either. But no, 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 you understand. In marriage for fun, you have to have two eyewitness that this marriage is going to take couple weeks, couple months, couple years, whatever it is, for this amount of dollar, and he must pay you. I said, my dear sister, in America, it's the same thing too. And you know what? So, so if you have to pay her, you can, will you be able to leave the prostitute without paying her? And then, so if a man go to a prostitute across the street and he pick up 10 of his friends as witness, it's make it lawful now? See, the Shia woman do not understand it's adultery. 
It's a prostitution because the Quran teaches to be holy marriage. When you see the debate between Shia and Sunni on this issue, it blows your mind. Because Muhammad married a woman for fun. So the Shia will say the Sunni, are you trying to tell me that my apostle, Prophet Muhammad, have lived in adultery? It is lawful. They said, yes, it was lawful, but he make it unlawful, and then it was lawful again, and he make it unlawful again, and he, a third time he make it unlawful, and that was it. And the Shia said, why he make it unlawful if it is lawful? And then he said, show me a verse in the Quran that says, marriage for fun is unlawful. Marriage in Islam, she said, cannot be, uh, sex in Islam cannot be outside marriage. It must be in marriage. What about this kind of marriage in the Quran? Where a man sleeps with a woman 10 minutes for 10 bucks. That is sex, prostitution. You may be called it marriage for fun. You may be called whatever you want to call it. It is sin. It is adultery. And do not compel your young females to become prostitutes if they want to keep chaste, so that you seek the material of the world's life. And whoever compels them, so surely after they were compelled, Allah is forgiving, merciful. Literally, a Muslim man can run a prostitution business from his home. He have 10 girls, 20 girls run business, and God is forgiving, merciful. Yes, don't do it, but if you do it, God is forgiving, merciful. Don't you like the word but? Every command in the Quran given to man, it have but, is a way out. Or if. Contrary to Christianity, Islam does not regard marriage as made in heaven or till death do us part. They are contracts with conditions. If either side breaks the conditions, divorce is not only allowed, but is usually expected. Nevertheless, a hadith makes it clear that of all the things God has allowed, divorce is the most disliked. Islam allowed divorce, but God said in the hadith that it is hated to him. Why God allowed what is hated to him? Christianity is a problem for you American ladies. She's trying to tell you, you're going to marry a guy and you get stuck with him. And if he did not treat you good, and if he treat you bad, and if he abused you, tough luck. That's it. You're going to live with him until you die. In, in Islam now, it is different. You can divorce your husband, which never happened. If either side break the condition, either side, you mean if a man did not treat his wife good, she can have divorce? A Muslim has a genuine reason for divorce only if a spouse's behavior goes against the Sunnah of Islam. In other words, if he or she has become cruel, vindictive, abusive, unfaithful, neglectful, selfish, sexually abusive, tyrannical, perverted, and so on. You know, if this woman went to Egypt and teach this slide alone, she would be killed on the spot. Literally, they will consider her a heretic woman. And they, they will kill her on the spot. Because she used the word spouses, and she used about if he or she, because what if a man want to spank his wife? What if a man would like to beat his wife? She can divorce him? She can't. I'll show you in a minute. It's always if she, if she add more salt to the food, she can get divorced. If she did not clean the house, she get divorced. If she did not obey him, she get, if she left the house without his permission, she get divorced. If she, she get, he divorced her. In good Islamic practice, before divorce can be contemplated, all possible efforts should be made to solve a couple's problems. After an intention to divorce is announced, there is a three-month period during which more attempts are made at reconciliation. I mean, this woman, she is lying through her teeth. The three months for more people to get involved. Maybe the pastor in the church go and talk to the couple. Maybe the family member talk. Try to help them out. Maybe they can be fixed. You don't understand. This woman, she have no clue what is divorce in Islam. Divorce in Islam, ladies and gentlemen, is the man open his mouth and say the statement, you are divorced. The divorce is done and it is over. But that's one count. 
A little bit back later, a husband can bring his wife. Within the three months, he can bring her back. And if he sleep with her, have a sexual relationship, the first divorce is over. But now she is back to him to be his wife. And then if he gets upset for some reason, something she went wrong, he can divorce her second time by saying the statement, you are divorced. And then she can leave, and within three months, he can bring her back, and then he can get mad at her one more time, and he divorces a third time by saying, you're divorced, and then she is free, but not for a long time. Because God gives another but, or another answer for men. Literally, you don't have even to say the word divorce. You can say one word equal to the word divorce, like you look at your wife and say, you are not lawful for me. I have no desire to have you as a wife. Any word has the same intention of your divorce and the divorce on the spot. If by the end of each month the couple have resumed sexual intimacy, the divorce should not proceed. The three-month rule ensures that a woman cannot remarry until three menstrual cycles have passed. So if she happens to be pregnant, the child will be supported and paternity will not be disputed. The three months is for one reason only, that if she is pregnant, have nothing to do with reconciliation or fixing the marriage. If she have a baby, she will feed the baby for two years and the baby go to Baba. Mama, dear sister, if you ever decided to marry a Muslim man and you have a son and he divorced you, your children are not yours, they are his. Period. The divorce is twice, so keep them in fairness or put them away in fairness. But it is not lawful for you to take what you have given to them of anything unless they fear that they cannot keep the limits of Allah. This is a two first strike. You divorce her, she come back. You divorce her, she come back. What happened if you divorce her the third time? She said, if they get together, the divorce is stopped. No, the divorce is already gone by saying the word, you're divorced. But listen to the third divorce. So, if he divorces her a third time, so it is not lawful for him to take her again until she has sex with another husband. So, if he divorces her, then there will be no sin on them if they return to each other, if they think that they can keep the limits of Allah. And these are the limits of Allah. He shows them to people who know. Until... She wedded another husband. So I pick up my phone. Hey, Muhammad, how are you doing, buddy? Doing good. Ah, uh, you know what? I blew it up. What did you do, man? I divorced my wife the third time. How many wives do you have? Three. Oh, praise God. I'm glad you only have three. Can you make my wife lawful for me? Sure, Brother Usama. No problem. Then Muhammad married my wife. They must have sex. Not married on paper. He, the hadith is very clear. They must have sex. And then if Muhammad divorced my wife, I can have her back and she'll be my wife back. That's the oxymoron of Islam. That's the opposite of what the Deuteronomy teaches. That's the opposite of what the Word of God says. Listen to what the book of Deuteronomy teaches. When a man hath taken a wife, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand. She may go and be another man's wife. And if the latter husband hate her, and write her a bill of divorcement, or if the latter husband die, her former husband may not take her again to be his wife, after that she is defiled, for this is an abomination before the Lord. The abomination of the Lord, the Word of God, the truth of the Bible, is a lawful thing to do in Islam. You divorce your wife, she come out to your house, she marry another man, even if her new husband die. It is not lawful for her to touch her again. This is abomination. Because God does not want to play in, in the marriage. Marriage is serious. You're going to divorce your wife, you might as well know for sure. You will never see her again, you'll never touch her again. So don't divorce your wives. But in Islam, it's the opposite. You divorce her three times, she can go marry another guy. If the other guy divorces her, now you can have her back. A few months later, divorce her three more times, get her another guy, sleep with her one time, she come back to you and we live like animals. 
we cannot ignore about the issue of divorce in Syria. Man only can divorce, and man cannot complete the authority of divorce unless he pays the remaining dowry, which can be made in payment. If the wife requests the divorce, in this case, the husband is not required to pay any remaining dowry. Take the word Syria out and put Muslim countries. Take the word Syria out and put Muslim people. Only man can divorce wife. Wife cannot divorce man. I would love to see one she ab were able to divorce her husband. It never happened. It will never happen. Only in America, because of democracy, our law allowed women to do that. But in a Muslim country, according to the Quran, no. Well, think with me. If a woman divorced her husband three times, and she want to marry him again, does he have to sleep with another woman before he go back to his first wife? It's a joke. You can't do that. I study the contract of marriage in our school, in college in Egypt. And the contract of marriage is literally like a contract of a painter. I did painting for years. And you say in it, I will paint Bastard so-and-so house for $3,000. $2,000 up front to buy the material and do the job. And $1,000 at conclusion, finish the job. I did this all the time for years here in, in Florida. In Islam, you have the same marriage. I will marry this woman for $2,000 dowry and $3,000 at divorce to be paid in payment. But if the wife asks for the divorce, she gets nothing of the rest of the contract. How hard is it for a man to make his wife seek divorce? Slap her in the morning, slap her at night, hit her in her face, beat her on her back, and she cried, divorce me, please, divorce me. <laughs> you're divorced. And if he's smart, he says three times, you're divorced, you're divorced, you're divorced. She is not lawful for him without paying a penny of the rest of the contract. A woman who seeks kula from her man without a just cause shall not enter paradise. And if a woman asks her husband to divorce her without reasonable cause, she spent eternity in hell. That's what Muhammad said. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered them and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. This is the answer from the Bible, church. Divorce is not in God's will. Some of us have been divorced once and twice. Learn from your mistake. God is forgiven. Thank God. Thank Jesus for dying for our sin. I'm not here to tell you you're, 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 you're have committed a big sin and God will not forgive. God forgive. But learn from it for the sake of your children and for your grandchildren. Unless you want to have your children have a bunch of grandchildren from a bunch of wives and husbands. When Muslims die, strict laws govern the shares of property and money they may leave to others. Daughters usually inherit less than sons. But this is because the men in a family are supposed to provide for their entire household. Any money or property owned by women is theirs to keep, and they are not obligated to share it. Similarly, in marriage, a woman's salary is hers and cannot be appropriated by her husband unless she consents. Well, inherit list is how much is inherit list? Allah commands you concerning your children to the male the like portion of two females. Why she didn't say half? Listen to the law in Saudi Arabia. In Saudi Arabia, King Fahd bin Abdul Aziz passed a law which stated that women are not allowed to work in any institution, public or private, or any government offices, no working whatsoever. The reason is because it is unlawful and stands against Islamic law and the tradition of the country. Is half is enough for a woman she cannot work? If it's my opinion, give her all the inheritance of her daddy. Because, see, they tell you that her husband will take care of her, so she, she, if she inherited half of what her daddy uh, leave for the family, uh, compared to her brother, it's enough. What about the women who are divorced? What about the women who are widows? What about the women who never get married? 
single one is half is enough? A good Muslim woman, for her part, should always be trustworthy and kind. She should strive to be cheerful and encouraging toward her husband and family and keep their home free from anything harmful. Harem covers all aspects of harm, including bad behavior, abuse, and forbidden foods. Regardless of her skills or intelligence, she is expected to accept her man as the head of her household. She must, therefore, take care to marry a man she can respect and whose wishes she can carry out with a clear conscience. However, when a man expects his wife to do anything contrary to the will of God, in other words, any nasty, selfish, dishonest, or cruel action, she has the right to refuse him. I'm telling you, this slide alone will get this woman killed if she came to speak in Egypt. She's a liberal woman in our culture, in our religion, in our way of life in Egypt. She must marry a man who can take care of her. What about all these millions of women who marry a man they haven't even seen? She's thinking with a British mentality. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Men are in charge of women because God preferred some of them above the others and because of what they spend out of their money. Her husband is not her master. A Muslim woman has only one master, and that is God. If her husband does not represent God's will in the home, the marriage contract is broken. What should one make of the verse in the Quran that allows a man to punish his wife physically? There are important provisos. He may do so only if her ill will is wrecking the marriage, but then only after he has exhausted all attempts at verbal communication and tried sleeping in a separate bed. Well, what's so hard for men to sleep in a separate bed with another wife? However, the prophet never hit a woman, child, or old person, and was emphatic that those who did could hardly regard themselves as the best of Muslims. Moreover, he also stated that a man should never hit one of God's handmaidens, nor, it must be said, should wives beat their husbands or become inveterate nags. So women don't beat your husband too. I don't know where she come up with this information from. Muhammad said, don't touch, don't hit woman, don't beat wife, don't hit your, your slave girls, and don't, don't. Let's, let's listen to what really happened. Let's listen to what really take place, what's the real story from the Muslim real sources. Why is it, O oh Aisha, that you're out of breath? I said, there is nothing. He said, tell me, or Allah would inform me. And then I told him. He said, was it the darkness of your shadow that I saw in front of me? I said, yes. He struck me on the chest, which caused me pain, and then said, did you think that Allah and his apostle would deal unjustly with you? This is his favorite wife. Baby Aisha and Muhammad hit her on her chest. Muhammad never touched any woman. He beat his own beloved wife. How about this one? And of whom you fear rebellion, so preach to them and separate from them in the beds and scourge them. So if they obey you, so do not seek a way against them. Surely Allah was higher big. That's not if the rebellion, if you fear that they may rebellion. You beat them, scourge them. Some translations, they put this word is beat them lightly, softly. Let's see the real explanation for the beating. In explanation of how severe the punishment should be, Ibn Kassir says that the punishment should not cause broken bones but it should be a light beating. No broken bones. You know, when a woman gets beat by her husband in Egypt and she runs to the police station, they take her to the hospital. No broken bones, x-ray, she go back to her husband. Omar took his wife and beat her, then said to Ashath, memorize three things for me, which I memorized from the prophet who said, the man is not to be asked why he beat his wife. 
Wow. Did Muhammad say, don't touch your wife? Or Muhammad said, if somebody beat his wife, no one dare ask him why your wife, she was screaming last night when you were beating her. See, they're teaching you the opposite of what Muhammad said. Muhammad said, don't touch any of your men. No, no, Muhammad said, if I beat my wife and you hear her cry from your own home, don't you dare ask me the next day why you were beating your wife last night. Rafa divorced his wife, whereupon Abdur Rahman married her. Aisha said that the lady came wearing a green veil and complained to her and showed her a green spot on her skin caused by beating. It was the habit of ladies to support each other. So when Allah's messenger came, Aisha said, I have not seen any woman suffering as much as the believing women. Look, her skin is greener than her clothes. The believing women were beaten by their believing men and their clothes, which was green, their body was greener than their clothes. That's how severe the pain was, the punishment was. Muhammad said, hang the whip where your wives can see it. One great Muslim scholar, Abdul Latif Mushtahari, explains by saying, if admonishing and sexual desertion fail to bring forth results, and the woman is of a cold, stubborn type, the Quran bestows on a man the right to straighten her out by way of punishment and beating, provided he does not break bones nor shed blood. You get the picture? According to Muslim scholar, reasons for a wife should be punished is refusing his sexual advances, leaving the house without permission, not caring about her appearance, not performing religious traditions. Muhammad said, if a man calls his wife to his bed and she refuses and he goes to bed angry, the angels will curse her until morning. Punishment is a great tool of correction and disciplining to those who receive it, if it was meant for their own good. It is foolish for humans to think that they cannot correct the community without physical punishment. A great example is the military, where they punish their soldiers. This is Professor Ahmed Chalabi. He teaches this in college in Egypt. Mohammed ordered a raid on a village that opposed him. His adopted son, Zaid, captured an elderly woman. He tortured her mercilessly and killed her by tying her feet with ropes to two separate camels, which went in different directions, splitting her in half. Finally, there is the issue of giving witness. Although the Quran says nothing explicit, other Islamic sources suggest that a woman's testimony in court is worth only half of that of a man. This ruling, however, should be applied only in circumstances where a woman is uneducated and has led a very restricted life. A woman equally qualified to a man will carry the same weight as a witness. I don't know who taught her that. First of all, she said, nothing explicitly in the Quran teach that. Well, I'm going to quote you a verse from the Quran. Other Islamic sources have, I'm sorry, the Quran says have. And then she said, it's only in the case of the, if, if the woman are mentally deficient or she cannot think. No, if it's a woman equal to man, as smart as man and everything equal to man. So if the debtor was mentally deficient or weak or cannot dictate, so let his friend dictate with fairness and call two witnesses from your men. So if there were not two men, so one man and two women, of those among you whom you are pleased for witnesses, so that if one of them should make an error, the other may cause her to remember. The whole thing is about women cannot remember. Women are stupid. If you're going to get uh, two witnesses, you need to get two men, if not one man and two women. So if one of them forgot, the other one remind her. It is the teaching of the Quran, not other sources. One woman of 99 women is in heaven, and the rest of them are in fire. Muhammad said, As I stood by the gate of hell, I saw that most of those who enter the gate are women. One percent of women in the world will get to heaven, and the rest are dying and going to hell. What is so encouragement for people to become Muslim? I don't know. Talk about women. They live on earth and hell, and when they die, they go to hell. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. 
Dear brothers and sisters, you heard the truth. Islam is growing in this country on one purpose, and one reason, one reason only is ignorancy. Yes, this Muslim man say it right when I read it in the email last night. American people are ignorant of the truth and the fact of what Islam is all about. Many people have serious questions about the religion of Islam. Who are Muslims and what do they believe? Liberal Muslim scholars and clerics spin the news and continually promote Islam as the religion of peace and that Jews, Christians and Muslims worship the same God. But is this true? Where can we turn for the answers? To truly know what a faith teaches, you have to go to the book. And for the last 1400 years, that book for Muslims is the Quran. This collection of the sayings and teachings that Muhammad claimed to have received from Allah is the sacred text for over a billion Muslims worldwide. But the Quran was written in Arabic, so how can we in the West learn what it really says? Muslim apologists have produced several English translations over the years, but these have been carefully edited to hide many of the blatant errors, immoral teachings, and violent commands throughout the book. In the beginning of our ministry, we decided to tell the truth about Islam. Uh, therefore, we decided to buy the English translation of the Quran to use the verses which is written there. Sadly, I could not find one Quran to present the truth as it is written in the Arabic language. They sugarcoat it. They water it down. That's why we decided to go ahead and translate the Quran from Arabic to English, a true English translation. The Straight Way of Grace Ministry, in cooperation with Arab and English scholars from around the world, has produced the most accurate English translation of Islam's holy book ever printed. Read for yourself exactly what Muhammad taught his followers about war and violence, about sex and marriage, about the treatment of infidels, and more importantly, what he said about Jesus. Islam is not what I share with you or what some moderate Muslim tell you. Islam is the verses of the Quran separate Muslim from Islam. There are so many wonderful Muslim people out there, but they are not true Muslim because simply they don't practice what the Quran teaches. So many American people say they accept Islam. They do not have any problem for Muslim to practice Islam in America, but same people rejecting Sharia, Islamic law. Not knowing that Sharia, Islamic law, is a practice of the verse of the Quran. This translation has been produced with the modern student in mind, with several key features including study notes for the reader, detailed notes concerning errors and contradictions in the text, careful comparisons between the Quran and biblical accounts, and references to the original sources that Muhammad borrowed from. Special sections discuss key topics such as a compilation of non-Arabic words and idioms found in the Quran, an easy-to-follow chart outlining the fulfilled prophecies concerning Jesus in the Old Testament and a challenging gospel invitation to introduce the reader to the scientific, historical, and biblical reasons for accepting the true Jesus as the only Lord and Savior. In the book of Hosea, chapter 4, verse 6, the Bible said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. It is time for us to read the Quran. It's time for us to find the truth for ourselves. For ordering and more information, please visit thestraightway.org. Read the Quran for yourself and understand the roots of this dangerous faith. Individual copy and case pricing are available. And what's he teaching here in America, which causes many of the Muslim, of the American women to become Muslim, is a lie. It is the opposite of what the Quran teaches and what the Hadith teaches. And I wish I had more time to share with you. But the good news is, Jesus said, the whole scripture said, the true faith said that no differences. We're all equal. Women, men, Jew, Greek, free slave in Christ. You're not free because you're an American. You're not free because uh, you, you, you live in this democracy of the United States. You are free, and the true freedom is to have it in Christ. Are you in Christ? Do you know Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior? That's the only way you can be set free. That's the only way a man and woman can be truly equal in God's eye when you have a relationship with Jesus. If you don't have the relationship with Jesus, even if you think you're free, you're a slave. You're a slave to sin. Women, appreciate your husband. Husband, love your wives. By this, we can have a strong Christian family. By this, we can have raise strong Christian children. And by this, we can defeat the lies and the darkness of Islam. So many of our ladies, young girls, are becoming Muslim. Just last Saturday, 
a preacher's daughter. She married a Muslim man. I don't know what the story, I don't know what the circumstances, but something went wrong. Spoken First Baptist Orlando, largest church we have, 14,000 people there. Three ladies came by, shaking my hand, married to a Muslim man, and their husband walking with them. And I was shocked. And this is happening all over Baptist church and all over churches. Our girls literally marry a Muslim man. The last two churches I spoke in, the pastor's mom married to a Muslim man. Just happened. This last two speaking I have. It is a lot. It's everywhere. We need to get back to the first love, the love of Christ, that we know the right thing. In her book, my Virginian, uh, uh, Miss Virginia lady, she said, if you're going to marry a Muslim man anyway, here is how you protect yourself. You need to write a contract with him, and in it you say, you cannot have my children to the mosque. In it you say, you cannot do this. In it you, can, you say, you don't do this. Muslim man will sign with 10 pieces of paper for you. The true advice is don't, never marry a Muslim man, period. Not even marry a Baptist who are not believer. If you know, he comes to the church and sing in the choir and we do all this stuff in the church, but you know he's not a believer, you don't marry him. Be obedient to the word of God. Thank you for allowing me to be here with you. Thanks, Dr. Smith, for having me here. And God bless you guys. Keep us in your prayer. Thank you so much. The Straight Way of Grace Ministry hopes that you were informed and blessed by this presentation. We've taken a close look at the status of women in Islam and found that, contrary to claims, Islam not only fails to raise the status of women equal to that of men, but rather, it condemns them to a much lower status. It teaches that men are in charge of women, that women are deficient in their minds, and only worth half as much as a man, that they are dirtier than dirt, and only one out of 99 women will go to heaven. Moreover, Islam promotes polygamous marriages forced marriages to strangers, and beating of wives. In fact, Muhammad led by example with the beating of his favorite wife, Aisha. Additionally, the issue of which was the first religion to raise the status of women was settled nearly 600 years prior to the founding of Islam. Galatians 3.28 reads in part, There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. God promises eternal life for all those who will put their trust in the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. Our sincere desire is that you would come to know the love of God and to experience the forgiveness of sins that He provides through Jesus Christ. If you have not yet trusted in Christ, would you pray a prayer like this one? Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I confess all my sins to you and ask that you forgive me. I believe that you died for my sins, and I want to turn from my sins. Thank you for forgiving me. Now I ask you to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. I confess you as the Lord and Savior of my life. I give you my life, and I ask that you would give me your Holy Spirit to take control of my life from this point on. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Other presentations in this series cover a wide variety of topics, from a comparison of the Bible and the Quran, through Jesus and Muhammad, to the Quran's confusion and distortions of Old Testament biblical characters. For a current listing of available presentations, to schedule presentations for your church or organization, or to find other helpful information, go to the ministry's website at www.thestraightway.org.